Hello, good morning, and welcome to our pre-recorded full Sunday in January 2021. Great to have you with us. Thank you for taking the time to watch this morning. We've got a great morning planned, haven't we? Why don't you tell we us have. what's coming up, Anna? Yes, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about climate change. So we've got Tim Wakeling, who's going to talk to us a little bit later, and worship from the Fresh Streams guys, and Resound from their Docs Ecology album. Fantastic. It's yeah. going to be great. It's going to be good. So we're going to get straight into that. We're going to start off our morning with David Attenborough's What a Wonderful World. Uh, I'm going to pray and then we're going to watch that. So Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity we have this morning to worship. Holy Spirit, come draw near to us in this moment this morning. We thank you that you made this world. You love it. As we listen, as we hear this morning, would you challenge us and encourage us? And would we know of your presence with us? Amen. Amen. I see trees of green, red roses too. I see them bloom for me and you. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. I see skies of blue clouds of white, bright, blessed days, dark, sacred night. And I think to myself, what a wonderful world. The colors of a rainbow, so pretty in the sky also on the faces of people going by. I see friends shaking hands, saying, how do you do? They're really saying, I love you. I hear babies cry. I watch them grow. They'll learn much more than I'll ever know, and I think to myself, what a wonderful world. Quite simply, wonderful. <laughs> Perfect 
perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. Oh, you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear it doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear it doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. She no longer has a place to hide and I am not a captive to the lights I'm not afraid to leave my past behind no I won't be shaken no I won't be shaken my fear doesn't stand a chance when I Stand in your love, my fear. It doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love, my fear. It doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Stand. Break 
break off every chain There's power that can empty out a grave Oh, there's resurrection power that can save There's power in your name There's power in your name Oh, there is power that can break off every chain chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love I'm standing near
the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then God looked over all he had made, and he said, It's good. Genesis 1. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day they continue to speak. Night after night they make him known. Psalm 19. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. Psalm 24. For God loved the world so much that he sent his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Which starts here and now, by the way. John 3. The whole of creation, the world and all of its people from the least to the greatest, is God's pride and joy. It's his masterpiece. He's poured literally his heart and soul into it. It's a painstaking, beautiful and interconnected creation and it speaks of God, its creator. Yes, it's fallen and it's no longer perfect, but it's still God's work which he loves. And it's his, not ours. But there's more. You made people only a little lower than, the God, than God, and crowned them with glory and honour. You gave them charge of everything you had made. Psalm 8. We've been given responsibility for it. We're stewards. God has put his pride and joy, including us, in our hands. What's the biggest thing you have ever made? Your pride and joy, maybe your life's work. Maybe if you have one, your own child, that you have entrusted to somebody. Maybe in the case of a child, sending them off to school or a spouse of their own. How did it feel? I guess you knew it was the right thing to do. You trusted whoever it was you were entrusting them to. But it still felt like a risk, didn't it? It felt sacrificial. Do you think God felt the same way when he put his creation into our hands? He knew we were able to care for it. Of course he did. But he also knew that we had the free will to choose not to. That's how it had to be. Of course, we chose to plunder it, not care for it, to treat it as infinite un and unbreakable when we knew, actually, that it wasn't. How do you think God feels now? How do you think God feels when non-Christians like Neil Ansell say it's a rather biblical thing, isn't it, to treat the world solely as a resource there for our own benefit? How do you think God feels when big megachurch pastors like Mark Driscoll say, I know who made the environment and he's coming back and he's going to burn it all up? So yes, I drive an SUV. For most of my life, I've been aware of climate change, but it's felt as if this concern has been more in my head than my heart. I didn't think very much about taking flights, diet, heating, purchases, or all the things that I do very much from a carbon perspective. And although I knew that government policy can do far more than we as individuals can do on our own, I've still been half-hearted about engaging with our MPs, rallies, petitions, everything that can uh, involve influencing our government, including direct action. You may still feel that way. And of course, I completely understand. In the last year or two, that's started changing for me. Uh, somehow this whole thing is moving from my head to my heart. I can't be sure why. Uh, maybe it was something to do with last year when Sam joined Extinction Rebellion. Well, two years ago now, in London. Maybe it was Greta. Maybe, I suspect, it was part of 
a move of God's Spirit, perhaps bigger than any move before. By the way, I don't see Greta as a prophet as such, but doesn't it seem very much in God's style to use a young girl with asperges to make us aware of where he wants us to go? It bothers me now that the government still doesn't have anywhere near as much ambition as it needs to, and it thinks it does. I feel more of an urge to push them now than I ever did, including being involved in things like XR. And I'm motivated now to try and remove fossil fuel burning from my life wherever I can. Not because it will change the world on its own, but because it will make my change of heart real. Because faith by itself, as we all know from James 2, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Don't get me wrong, I often make easy choices and rationalise them and still talk about whether it will pay itself back in money terms. But I'm, I'm on a journey and I pray that you'll join me. It's a journey for everyone. Not that we can't enjoy what God has made. Of course we can, we must. Or that we should feel guilty. Jesus did not come so that we could all sit around feeling guilty. But we do have a crisis to deal with. How much of a crisis, exactly? Well, at least three. Climate change is one. Uh, the decimating of ecosystems, deforestation and so on is another. Um, and the issue of plastic pollution is another one. They're all interconnected, of course. But let's just quickly look at climate change and how serious that is. It's widely accepted, I think, that the world has warmed just over one degree now from since before the Industrial Revolution. And if it warms more than one and a half degrees, we will have a serious problem. 90% of coral reefs at that temperature will die. Vast swathes of Africa and Asia will become literally entirely uninhabitable. Greenland melts. Sea levels rise. Mumbai London and cities around the world become inundated. And we know that to have a 66% chance of avoiding that temperature, even assuming we don't discover any more unexpected effects, we need to be using no more than 235 gigatons of carbon dioxide from now on. And we're emitting about 30 or more every year. At least we were until 2020. Well, 2020, eh? <laughs> lockdown, lockdown was tough for many people, and it still is. We experience it differently, and for many people it's cruel and devastating. It isn't the answer to the climate crisis, but the temporary halt in carbon emissions does give us a glimpse of something. You see this dot? on the graph. Now brace yourself. Here's what needs to happen from now on to keep us within that carbon budget. Basically we need to reduce our CO2 output every single year by the same amount as those lockdowns. Until we reach zero. Do you, do you, you see now why a bit of uh, recycling or a few more efficient appliances is simply not going to do it. In fact, we're not going to do it without God's help, I think. Climate and ecosystem breakdown are literally the biggest crises the world has ever faced. And the solution, as I say, is not more lockdowns and it's certainly not vaccinations. It probably involves something like people's assemblies, shared resolutions and pauses in harmful activity with compensation while we develop alternatives. But thanks to COVID, we can see that the things we never thought were realistic are, in fact, possible. If we tackle the climate crisis as urgently and as radically as we've tackled COVID, which we now see we can do, the world's poorest people will still suffer because those impacts have already started. 
But if we do nothing, the consequences are simply unimaginable. Let me play you a video from Tier Fund. For me, addressing climate change is, how are we gonna protect the most vulnerable? We have the moral responsibility to do everything to put us on track to a maximum temperature of 1.5. Life is very challenging here. It hasn't rained for six months, and I don't know when it will rain next. For many people around the world, the impact of climate change is devastating. In the north of Ethiopia, they used to expect rain up to four months a year, but now it rarely comes. People don't have enough water to survive. We have no food and are dependent on our livestock for our livelihood. Whenever there is no rainfall, our animals die as there is no grass or water. When it rains, I only need to walk five minutes to collect water, but these water sources are now dry. Every night, I walk for 10 hours to collect water from a lake. The length of the dry season is increasing. I worry about my children and my family. I feel worried whenever I think about the future. We are on course for global temperature rises that will put millions of lives at risk as extreme weather events such as droughts become more frequent and it's the poorest who are hit the hardest. But we are at a turning point. Decisions are being made now about how we build back from coronavirus that will shape our economy, society and climate for decades to come. As Christians, we have a vital role as we pray, speak out for change, and love our neighbours across the world through how we live. You can help turn the tide on climate change and build a better world for us all, including people like Orbisa. We have a huge potential that has not been unleashed yet. We are facing a world that is forever changed, but that we have the capacity to build much better living conditions for our children, their children, and their children, mm. if we only set our mind to it. Together, let's call on the UK government to lead the world towards a greener, fairer future. Add your voice to our petition today. Now is the time to unite in prayer and action to see a breakthrough in the climate crisis. So, here's a map of the world showing emissions per capita in 2011. It doesn't include historic emissions, and arguably it should, but it does show who's driving climate change right now. Now, here's a map of climate vulnerability. It shows the places that will be hit hardest by global warming, including extreme weather, drought, sea level rise, that sort of thing. Isn't it striking how one of them is pretty much the mirror image of the other? The countries most responsible for climate change are the least at risk. The places that will reap the whirlwind are the least responsible. They're also the least prepared with the fewest resources to adapt. Now have a think about the skin colour of the people in each map. Those responsible and those vulnerable. We know on whose backs the Industrial Revolution happened. We know that's not a coincidence. Do you see why in 50 or 100 years time people are going to talk about climate change the same way we talk about the slave trade today and wonder how Christians ever defended it? See, these are, what I'm trying to say is these are not just crises of science. They are crises of humanity and justice as well. And that's why as Christians, we must be involved. What does the Lord require of you? We know this passage. To act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. Micah 6. And God sees all people. 
There is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, nor male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3. As Christians, it seems to me that there are a couple of deceptions we can fall into if we're not too careful. One is to be lulled into the trap of saying, well, God is sovereign and none of this is really happening at all, or if it is, it's his plan anyway, and he will sort it out. We should trust him. It sounds spiritual enough, a bit, but it does ignore, unfortunately, the, plan, the fact that throughout scripture and throughout history, God hasn't made a habit of sweeping in and sorting out things that people won't take responsibility for themselves. I believe God's in the business of supernatural transformation. Of course I do. Not denial of reality. Jesus didn't pretend that the people who came to him weren't sick. But when they asked, oh yes, he supernaturally transformed their situation. The other trap is, as Mark Driscoll, who I quoted earlier, to think that, well, it doesn't nearly really need to be sorted because the world's going to end anyway. Well, this uh, deception conveniently ignores the fact that God's gift matters to God. Remember those things that meant the most to you. It matters to God. And it also distracts us from the truth that honouring it by living sustainably is actually, like all of God's commandments, for our own good and our own benefit. People in 50 years' time, living in cities largely free of air pollution, I would hope, will probably look back on today's cities in the same way that we look back on smog-filled Victorian London and will wonder why Christians ever tried to defend the status quo. But there's an alternative. What if instead of that, they saw the church being prophetically ahead of its time in leading us out of this? Gus Speth, um, he was a senior US advisor on climate change, and he said this. I used to think that the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could solve these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are, in fact, selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. Scientists don't know how to do that. The world doesn't know how to do that. A cultural and spiritual transformation, a new way of living that turns everything we think we know on its head, a new heart for people and justice. Sound familiar? It should. Enter the church. This is our moment, isn't it? This is it. There has never been a bigger need or a bigger opportunity, which God and his church are more equipped for than this one. The church knows more than anyone about valuing people over money and growth, doesn't it? The church knows more than anyone about living sustainably with a profound awareness of our place in the world, doesn't it? The church knows more than anyone about lifting up the least, the last and the lost, doesn't it? We already know that we need limits to be who Jesus wants us to be. Jesus had his own limits. He didn't see equality with God as something to be grasped, but he chose to be humble and to limit himself. Endless straining to move faster, do more, fit in more, consume more. It's exhausting, isn't it? Isn't that, is that what God has made us to be? Without God, of course, the situation is hopeless. But if we did, repent and ask for God's help. Would he bless a hundredfold our determination to put a line in the sand and say no more? Would he? Of course he would. If my people 
who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and restore their land. 2 Chronicles 7. With God, all things are possible. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Eager expectation. Romans 8. Will we as the church humble ourselves, admit our role in this, pray, seek God's face, stop trying to justify the status quo and even spiritualizing our consumption? And will we live simpler, healthier, more sustainable lives, leading by example and, most importantly, using our considerable influence on those around us and in political power? so that future generations can look back and say, well, yes, it was God, through his church, who saved us. How good would that be for the mission of the church in decades to come? Our own church's vision, of course, as you know, is to bring healing, wholeness and freedom to broken lives and communities, as we expect great things from God and attempt great things with God. What greater thing can we expect from God and what greater thing can we attempt with God than the healing, wholeness and freedom of all people and creation by a cultural and spiritual transformation that begins with his Holy Spirit in us? The challenge is huge. We can't do it on our own. It's something that we need God profoundly for. But never forget, we are the ones with the hope, the power and the grace to do this. I believe God's Holy Spirit is on the move. Not in 2030 or some distant 2050 net zero possibility, but now, today. If not now, when? Loss. We remember 
the source of healing a flowing out from Jesus cross you came down for us It's great to have Dave Sims come down and join us. Dave, it's great to see you. It's great to see your face and actually <laughs> yeah. in person. Real people. Which is amazing. Nice, yeah. So uh, Dave's come down. He's gonna, we're going to have a conversation and chat about climate change and uh, what's going on in the world and, and the kind of the part that we can play in that. So uh, we're going to jump straight into it. That's all right, Dave. Thanks, Ed. Thanks for good having stuff. me. You doing all right? It's good to be here. Yeah, yeah, doing well. Yeah, yeah. doing well. All good yeah. in the Sims household? Yeah, we're doing well. Yeah. About to become a dad for yeah. the second time. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, we're, we're doing well, yeah. So when's the baby due? Just remind us. Oh, precious on now. Uh, middle of April. Middle of April. Wow. Yeah. Good yeah. stuff. Love it. Right, should we jump in? Yeah, jump in. So um, we've got a few kind of things we're going to talk about, a few talking points and stuff. The first one is about climate and ecology, about how the situation going on in our world is actually turning into quite an emergency state. Things are looking quite serious. So um, why don't you just fill us in on just a few kind of things that, from your perspective of what's going on and, yeah, just share. Yeah, the the problem with climate change is that it's it's a big problem and it's pretty slow. Yeah. And so us as humans, we're really good at dealing with things that are really close in our face Um and and when and when it's not in your face you you might think oh yeah that seems to be quite an important issue but you always put it to the to the back of your back yeah. of your mind there's more important things going on in the world and yeah, yeah. generally there is always more important things apparently going on in the world but yeah. climate change is something that is so massive it will impact most aspects of our lives yeah and certainly in in the global south and in poorer areas mm. it will impact well it's already impacting them now and we kind of need to wake up to what we're doing what what this what the situation is you know we are we are a big heavy goods train yeah going along the track but the track is going to run out at some point but yeah. we we haven't even really put the brakes on if if anything the train's accelerating yeah. and we're like no we really need to bring this train to a stop before it starts going horribly wrong yeah. and even in the in the uk as well there's been many reports of like you know don't quote me on the numbers but they're dramatic it's mm. like the amount of wildlife has gone down by a third in a decade or you know mm. crazy numbers like yeah. that and it's yeah. really serious but sometimes when we're just carrying on in our lives we kind of don't notice that and yeah. notice how much of an emergency it is. yeah so so why why should we care then I know i'm just kind of asking the question but why, why should we care as particularly as christians as well um we should care about nature and environment because god does 
because God created it and he said that it was good and mm. he said that we should look after it. Um, I know some people have come back and said, well, God said that we should have dominion over it. So, but dominion doesn't mean that we should dominate and destroy. Dominion means that we have responsibility over it. So mm. analogy would be, if I lend you my car, mm. then I will give you full control, full dominion over that car and you can yeah. use it and, you, you know, do what you need to do with it. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I don't want you to return it in a big <laughs> scrap up ball. Yeah. 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 I don't want you to be going off roads on it and I don't want you to be carrying animals in the back or, you know, whatever. You, there's yeah. that, that word is much, there's much more to it. It's much better to say, um, uh, st stewardship. Yeah. That we have stewardship over the world, that we're, that we're a gardener and we should look after it. And so the argument to just be like, well, the earth is there to be used how we like. Don't think there really is an argument for that. As Christians to say that God created the world and God created us and it was good and beautiful. If we go out and are uh, destroying it and not caring about it, what does that say about what we think about God? Yeah, that's a good point. I like that. I think I'm reminded of um, the blessing that Abraham gets and the call of Abraham and the Israelites in the Old Testament. And I love this because this just helps to frame so much of the Bible and so much of us as Christians is that God called Abraham to uh, and that he would have, you know, generations after him, too numerous to count and that they would be a blessing to the nations around them, to the world around them. Uh, and how Israel interpreted a lot of that through the Old Testament as be a blessing, as in we will be in charge and rule. And actually, that's not really what God meant. God, God did want them to, to be prosperous and to grow, but he wanted them to bless the nations by basically living faithfully to Yahweh, to God, and then uh, letting others catch hold of that relationship and bring them into that relationship. That was the kind of the yeah. whole idea. And I think that's the same, isn't it? When As we look at what's going on in our world, actually... Yeah, I, I, I really love that idea of, you know, the lending of the car just really helps to kind of paint a picture of how we should look after the world because God did create it and he said it was good. And, uh, and I really love that last point. You just said that, that actually, what does it say about our relationship with God if we don't care about what he created? Um, and it doesn't mean that we can't use the natural resources of the world. It just means that we have to think about how we're using them and why we're using them, doesn't it? I'm not a fan of saying, oh, you individuals, it's your fault, you need to change. Yeah, if you're flying around the world several times a year yeah you, you really need to change in your private jet yeah 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 and and those top end consumers they definitely need to change yeah. it's more of a case of when you have the option of doing it yeah do the right thing and do yeah. the the clean green mm -hmm. thing but really the biggest personal thing is is to educate yourself okay is to learn about it yeah because when you learn about it you will change. We know as Christians, the truth sets you free. Yeah. Yeah. Learn about how serious the situation is because there's a lot of money and a lot of big influence that doesn't, that wants to stop our current economic yeah. system that is based primarily on getting energy from deep out of, out of the ground and mm -hmm. using that to do stuff to make money. Yeah, yeah. A lot of our economy is based on that and a lot of big money and big influence yeah. is based on that. Look at proper scientific research or at least someone that knows about science, you know, listen to the professionals explaining it in an understandable way. Mm. Yeah. Because then when you realise how much of a big situation it is and how much it should be in the forefront of our mind, I really think that... that destruction of the natural world and and indirectly the people that it affects god loves those people so so much yeah and we need to realize the the that we need to change our ways mm. Mm. it's a repentance story really yeah we really need to change the the big picture the big system yeah don't get distracted by doing you recycling oh it's okay yeah. it isn't okay yeah 
we shouldn't be fearful of the authorities. We should, yes, obey them if, if the laws yeah. are good. But if they're doing something wrong, and then you should make sure that they know that they're doing something wrong. You know, mm. Moses went to Pharaoh and said, you need to stop. Yeah. You know, you need to change. These these people are in horrible situations. You know, they need to be given freedom. And I feel mm. like similar things can apply with how we're treating the earth and the and the globe so the big change that we need to do politicians won't be able to do it yeah yeah and i think you know for us as just ordinary people who live in the uk it is that uh, as christians and it is that um again just that coming back to where we started god created this earth and us to to steward it and I think it's just bringing that to our bringing that to our forefront of our minds on a regular basis. Actually, we're here. To, we need to steward this. We need to play our part in looking after this world. Um, we need to pray for it. We need to seek after its its um, welfare and yeah. care and all the all the rest of it. Play our individual part, but also you know try and challenge the system part as well. Um, yes, if yeah. you, we we can't be standing by mm. as our leaders continue to do something that's so destructive. Yeah. That, if you learn anything from history, you yeah. know, we need to be on the right side of history. And as as Christians, as the church, yeah, we need to do that. Yeah. You know, at the, the Church of England or how the church is seen nationally, we need to be yeah. on the right side and for the right reasons. Mm. Yeah, it, When the church stands up and says certain things need to change... Yeah. Those things do change. Mm. You know, we do still have influence yeah. and power. We just kind of need to get on and do it sometimes. Yeah. So I think sometimes we've lost confidence in ourselves. Yeah. We've lost confidence in our gospel. We've lost confidence in our message. Um, but actually we need to regain some of that confidence in, in so many areas of what it means to be a Christian. And yeah. yeah, we should probably uh, draw it to a close. Uh, thanks for coming down and chatting. Thanks. thanks for sharing your heart as well for this. And, uh, and you carry this deeply and, and passionately as a, as a, as a follower of Jesus as well. So um, it's good to hear what just your experience and your, and your heart as well. Uh, and just to, um, and to share that with us as well this morning. So thanks mate. And uh, okay. God bless you. Thank and you your much. family as you head towards having another baby. And uh, yeah, it's great. Let's pray together this prayer from Pope Francis. Bring healing to our lives, Lord, that we may protect the world and not prey on it, that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we are profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our struggle for justice, love, and peace. Amen. God, the maker of the heavens and the planet that we share, show us how to live like Jesus, lives of gratitude and care.
Hey, thank you so much for taking the time out to join us this morning. I hope you've been challenged and encouraged. Thank you to Tim as well for speaking to us and for Dave Sims coming down earlier in the week uh, to chat with me here in HLC. It's been a great morning, some great worship as well, some great stuff that we've done this morning. And uh, mm -hmm. we've got a great week ahead. What's coming up? Yeah. So on Monday night, we've got the church family gathering at eight o'clock. So the info will be in the Friday email. If you don't have that, email Hazel. Fantastic. Yeah, looking forward to that. It's going to be on Zoom. We have some worship and chat about HBC and just church life generally and the year ahead. So join us on Monday night. Have a great week. Be blessed and we'll see you again soon. Bye. Bye.